Thank you very much. I, I'm surprised you didn't notice that I'm on the Army Leadership Board. I think I'm the first woman and by far the oldest member ever on the Army Leadership Board. When I, when I uh, told my dad, he said, uh, he emailed me right back. And my dad's nearly 90, so he's a good emailer, but he doesn't email every day. But this one really, he was really shocked by, and he wrote, emailed me right back and he said, Salvation Army? <laughs> I said, no dad, I'm in the Army now. And I have to say, I am so impressed with New Zealand's army. And I'm a pacifist, and I uh, demonstrated against Vietnam. Uh, so I'm, I feel I've got to, uh, when I say that, I know what I'm talking about. And so you won't be surprised then today that I'm talking to you about integrity systems. Um, and I want to say, I want to start by saying warm Pacific greetings to you all. And also, that, uh, as an American, uh, I'm particularly grateful that you've invited me to speak to you today. Um, now, to be fair, I've lived in New Zealand for 42 years, and this is my country, <laughs> and I love it. And as you can tell, um, Wellington's my city, and I love Wellington. And, and uh, so I want to talk to you about um, something that's really amazing um, about what we've got here. Um, and I think it fits really well with your theme um, about being locally engaged and, and globally connected and provides huge opportunities for us going forward. Um, so you know that this is a milestone year for New Zealand because it's an election year. Um, what you may not know as well is that New Zealand is, has a very special opportunity uh, because Australia is hosting the G20. And, and, and normally we don't even come close to being able to participate in the G20 as uh, uh, one of the smallest countries in the world um, and our GDP is now 32nd in the world. Um, but because we're neighbors, close neighbors of Australia, we've been invited to participate um, as an equal member um, with the other uh, G20 nations. And the other invited guest is Singapore. Now, the um, f thing about these uh, G20 meetings is that they're called alphabet soup. And that's because the G20 happens in November, and the theme, by the way, is about growth, world growth, coming out of the global financial crisis, coming into a period of growth. Um, but during the year, we've already had the F20, which was all the finance ministers, and we've had the, um, and we're having coming up, we'll have the B20, which is all businesses, and we will have the C20, which is civil society organizations, and the Y20, do you know what that is? Youth. <laughs> anyway, um, what I wanted to say about this milestone year is um, to, to remind you about the area where New Zealand is number one. So um, anybody know what number one I'm going to be talking about? Rugby World Cup? <laughs> I mean, the other, last February, I, I was in the, in the Kuru Lounge with, um, the Prime Minister was right next to me, and I said, John, what is New Zealand number one at? And he said, rugby? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's not that, and of course we are, but um, no. Um, the international perception, as measured by the Transparency International Corruption Perce Perceptions Index, is that New Zealand has the most trusted public sector in the world. Now, we, when I say most trusted public sector in the world, at, in, in 2013, we tied for number one with Denmark. But over the 20 years that this Corruptions <coughs> Perception Index has been measured, New Zealand's public sector has measured in, as number one, first or first equal, for 18 of the 20 years. Now, this is an amazing, achievement. Um, what does it mean to you? Well, it means, um, for a start, that wherever you are, whatever you do in New Zealand, you're treated with respect. And if you're not, there are systems in place to demand redress. Um, but the thing that's interesting about it is that um, if you were an alien reading our newspapers, you would think New Zealand was full of corruption. Now, the score isn't 100%. As we know, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, the score is only 91. But even though we only had the second fastest boat 
everyone's still extremely proud of our performance in the America's Cup. You'd think that when you go around Wellington and talk about the CPI, that we, there was something really wrong with us. Because most public servants you talk with will tell you that they don't believe it, they don't trust it, um, they, they don't have pride in it. And the challenge of that is that neither does our private sector have pride in having this kind of public sector trust. Now, what does it mean? Well, it means that you can get up every day and go to work or go to university or go, go to your not-for-profit organization or go to your public sector job and nobody's going to ask you for a bribe or a facilitation payment. I had a ride in the car recently with former police commissioner Howard Broad and he said to me that the whole time he was police commissioner, in fact the whole time he was in the police force, he was never offered a bribe, ever. Do you know that for 75, 80, maybe as many as 90 percent of the world's populations, they cannot say that? They cannot say that they have never offered the police a bribe or that their police have never been bribed. When you look at the map, and I've left some copies of the map here for you to pick up um, that measures the different um, CPIs across all the countries in the world, what you'll see is that about 75% of the world is what you'd call the red zone. And that's areas where the scores that they have are 50% or below in terms of their, their corruptions perceptions index. New Zealand is the yellowest of the countries. And thinking locally and engaging globally, there's a huge opportunity for us in New Zealand to set the pace to show what it is like to be an ethical and trusted country and so that in our lifetime we can move the, red zone, the, move the red zone closer up to the top of the world where our yellow zone moves up and takes over parts of the red zone. I'd like to think that that's a reality for all of us instead of the other thing which people tell me is more likely to happen that as we increasingly trade into Asia, our country is going to become more corrupt. Now, how can we avoid this corruption? Well, the first way is to actually know what we've got. And so just to understand what we've got, Transparency International, the chapter of Transparency International, uh, the New Zealand chapter, had a good look, a good hard look at our institutions. And what we found is the institutions of New Zealand are really strong. When we had a good look at them, they still measure up and they sc still score highly. This was carried out by 35 expert researchers, including one of your members here, Grace Lang. Um, and we looked across uh, orga uh, organizations in New Zealand. We did a huge number of, of interviews. And if you go on our website, you'll find a, a very lengthy and full report about what it means in New Zealand to have strong integrity systems. And yet only 5% of New Zealanders know anything about Transparency International or about how important this is to them. Let me just talk about, secondly then, about what this means in real terms to New Zealand. Because New Zealand's public sector has such a strong international reputation, there are seven key areas where we could actually be making gains far and above what we're currently doing if we were, if we were to start off by being proud of what we've got. The things that the starting point of all this is good reputation. You're much more socially connected than I am. So you'll be aware that having a strong reputation increases your network automatically. Your friends who have got good images, good brands, attract people to them without even trying. So you cannot, in this world, go past the value of a strong brand. But what's so incredible about the brand that we have at the moment is that we haven't gone out to people and said, hey, look at us, this is our strong brand. The rest of the world has looked at New Zealand and given us this strong brand. It's the rest of the world that thinks so highly of what it is that we've got. We know that, com that co um, companies who have strong brands are actually going to be able to attract capital easier. 
they're going to have easier access into international markets. And we know also that they're going to have an increased return on investment. Now, how do we know about the increased return on investment? There's a company called Ethosphere in the US, and since 2007, it has been identifying the world's most ethical companies. When it looks at these world's most ethical companies and how they've performed on the share market, they've found that between 2007 and 2011, whereas most companies fell, so the average on the Standard & Poor's Index was a fall of 8.5%, companies which were judged to be ethical actually increased their value over that period by 35% on average. So we know that ethical companies are the way to go. A huge gap in our knowledge, though, is the understanding that companies are not all alike. And the starting point for many people is that companies are bad and that any company that's involved in any kind of enterprise is naturally not going to be ethical. The reality is that, like governments, companies are a spectrum, and what we need to understand is what makes them good and what makes them bad. Now, the other reason why a company wants to be good and why we need to trade on our amazingly good reputation is because surveys have show time and again that customers want to buy from ethical companies and staff want to work for ethical companies. What does this mean for New Zealand? First of all, it means that our companies are not, at the moment, gaining what they could be. By changing their perception about how good our public service is, it means that they could gain in seven key ways. We have good examples of companies like Assure Quality, who have, by trading into China, have been able to get access to markets with the biggest food conglomerate in the world that other countries and companies in the world could only dream of doing. The aspect of that is that the scale that Assure Quality now goes from is from trading in a population of New Zealand of a little over four and a half million to trading into the billions of populations in China. So the kind of return that that company can bring back means that it's got the margins to move from just having everyday type jobs for its employees to having innovative and creative jobs, environmentally sustainable jobs, and that it can invest in the future for the continuous development of those jobs. So thirdly then, as you can see, the benefits of this amazing reputation that New Zealand has can apply quite directly to you as individuals. The good reputation is something which you yourselves can use to trade on your own business development. And I'm sure that many of you in this group will go on to actually have your own businesses, not to work for others, but to have your own startup businesses, your own, own, um, own modern electronically connected businesses, socially connected businesses. You'll find that the role that you play in that regard is going to be much better than a similar person trying to start up a similar type of, com of company, even in Australia, where their um, CPI is much lower than New Zealand. When you go to employ staff, you'll find that there's staff that want to work for you. When you go to open up a customer base, you'll find that there's customers that want to work with you. You'll find that people that want to join your supply chain will be ethical and will want to continue the ethics of your business so that you're ethical from gate to plate, so to speak. Now think about this. What does that mean? It means that you can show and demonstrate in real terms on an individual day-to-day -day basis that being ethical is not just a good thing to be. It's not just about good governance and high trust and being able to do business on a handshake. It actually makes good sense in terms of the bottom line and in terms of the overall success and growth of your business. Now think about the Arab Spring. What do we see there? Hundreds and thousands of students and youth who have all been able now to use their cell phones, 
to take pictures of the war zone and what's happening, to bring everything graphically to us in our living rooms, what's going to happen to them? What are we seeing happening to them? They're going from one regime to the other because there's, at the moment, there's no forward movement. The lack of organizations to provide jobs for them, the lack of innovation in their business sector, the perpetual war that their countries have been on, that's been ongoing for them, means that they just go from one thing to the next. This is why I'm so proud of New Zealand. We have got an opportunity here to demonstrate that we don't have to have a world like that. You're here, and I'd like to invite all you to join the real team New Zealand to show and demonstrate that we can create jobs based on integrity, based on good governance, based on the international perception of how good we are. And by doing so, we provide a forward path for all New Zealanders. And by the way, I'd like to bring a lot of them home, please. I'd like all of you to go over and have your OE, and I want you all to come back because we've got a precious talent pool here. The legacy for having these strong integrity systems did not come from nowhere. It came from those who came before us. It, they've given us a precious and valuable legacy. Let's, let's keep it going. Thanks very much. <laughs>